This is the old cemetery in Birch's Garden, and uh, it's in the centre of town. You can see the mountains around, and uh, behind me is actually the Albert Salzburg, well, it's about four or five kilometres from here, and uh, that's uh, sort of where Hitler lived. And here we have the grave of a rather important person within the Nazi administration. This is the grave, as you can see, of uh, Hans Lammers. Oh, there he is, 27th of May, 1879. He was born in Lubliniec, which is in Upper Silesia now, it's in Poland. He went to uh, university in uh, Breslau, now Wrocław, uh, also studied in Heidelberg as well. And he, he was working in uh, Boyden, which is now Bitum in Poland. S served in the First World War, he got the Iron Cross first and second class, and after the uh, defeat, uh, and let's face it, by then he was, was getting on a bit in life for it to be a soldier, he was uh, 39 years old. Uh, he joined the German DNVP, that's the uh, German National People's Party. And uh, he was quite well known in politics, well to politicians I should say, he was a lawyer. And, uh, and he was the undersecretary at the uh, Ministry of Interior. Now, the uh, thing was, he joined the Nazi party in 1932 and uh, after the seizure of, pa of power he was made the state secretary and uh, he was head of the Reich Chancellery and um, he, he was a friend of uh, Wilhelm Frick who uh, was Reich Minister and so he, because of that, that got him a job in a legal advisor to all uh, government departments and uh, on the 30th of November uh, 1939. Having been a couple of years promoted to uh, being a member of the Hitler cabinet, he uh, became a member of the Council of Ministers for the Defence of the Reich. And that meant that he was able to see all documents related to defence, security and uh, this type of thing. And um, because of the, the way that power was centralised, but at the same time uh, there was all these competing departments, Lammers, uh, really became a very important person, uh, a civil servant, but uh, at the same time he gave the impression he was actually speaking for Hitler. A um, very curious thing is that the expression Heil Hitler, well obviously he didn't think of it, but he was possibly one of the first people who started to use it on correspondence. And um, this later became, if he didn't say Heil Hitler, you know, became a, uh, in the army became ob obligatory. And um, uh, anyway, he possibly coined the phrase in official correspondence. Now, uh, one thing that's important, I think, to show his power is that he controlled access to Hitler alongside Martin Bormann. So whoever saw Hitler, uh, that was the decision of Bormann. So effectively, uh, Hitler usually gave in to the people he saw. So effectively, uh, Bormann was controlling the country. Now, there's one thing about Hitler is he would, uh, somebody come in and say they wanted uh, something to black, Hitler would agree, then somebody else come and say they want the same thing white, Hitler would agree, and then they had to sort of fight it out between themselves, because Hitler would just sort of, uh, that's the way he uh, ruled, not very clear. Strangely, he managed to get the power he did when he was, he was so, in many ways, indecisive. Anyway, um, because of the uh, defeats, or defeat in above all at Stalingrad, Hitler agreed to the creation of a three-man committee to represent the state, the army, and the party. So, who did that? Wilhelm Keitel for the army, uh, Martin Bormann, and Hans Lammers, the three of them together. Now, you can actually read quite a lot about this in uh, the book by uh, Albert Speer, because he sort of describes it. I mean, obviously, he was sort of denied power, but he, he sort of formed an alliance to a certain extent with Goebbels, with Goering and uh, Himmler. And uh, so they had these two sort of competing groups working against each other at the same time as there was uh, a war that was on. Now this, this committee uh, didn't only met, I think it was 11 times, so it didn't really have a great deal of importance. Now, in April 1945, uh, Berlin is surrounded and on the 23rd, Goering, uh, consults uh, Lammers and Karl Koller and as a result of this Goering thinks that he can send a 
ultimatum in some ways to Hitler. It wasn't all that really so much of an ultimatum. It was quite nicely done, worded. It was uh, in such a way as that if Hitler is no longer able to maintain control, then um, he will take over powers as the leader of the Third Reich. Now, when this end turned up in Berlin, I think Hitler possibly was more or less likely, he could, he could have agreed to it, but Bormann egged him on in, in such a way that Goering was arrested. And clearly those who were on the side of Goering, such as Lammers and others, uh, they were also arrested. And effectively, this was uh, tantamount to a sentence of death. Now, Goering said at Nuremberg that uh, Hitler would have forgiven him once he, when, when, when he met him. But that happened here, at, uh, well, behind me, uh, the Ober Salzburg. Um, Lammers was effectively saved by the Americans. Uh, that's the irony of it. So you've got this Nazi minister who's been liberated by the Americans. Uh, but uh, his, and we've got two names here, and this is the tragedy of his, fa his family. Uh, you can see both his wife and his daughter there. His wife committed suicide on the 8th of May, and his daughter followed on the 10th of May. Um, I'm not too certain why they committed suicide. Now, Lammers himself was tried. He was, uh, in 1949, he was, an, uh, ex, uh, he was a um, witness at Nuremberg. He was tried in 1949. He got a 20-year sentence. It was used to 10 years. And in 1951, he was released alongside many other former Nazis. The, um, uh, he went to live in Dusseldorf. He died there, as you can see, in 1962. And he was wanted to be with his wife and his daughter in death, so that's why he's now here. Uh, he's a person who is not very well known, despite the importance he had in ruling the Nazi state. Now you've heard all them other, the, all the others I, I mentioned, uh, Albert Speer, Goering, uh, Goebbels, <laughs> but have you heard of Hans Lammers? Unless you're sort of really into the Second World War, the chances are you haven't. Now, I want to put this in context, though we can't quite make everything out because of the tree, but uh, I've got the Kelstein mountain up there, and the eagle's nest is there, and the Ober Salzburg is roughly directly in front now, because they, um, Hitler had, had the Berghof up there. Berghof in German, that means uh, Berg's mountain, Hof is court, so it's the uh, where Hitler held court. He spent at least two months a year here uh, and every year. And this is, to a large extent, this was the surrogate capital of Germany during the Nazi year because Hitler had come here in, in the, the first time he was in 1923, but then he came in 1920 to holiday here and once he became dictator, uh, he bought the uh, property he used to rent and that's, that and all the hangers on came here as well. So, I filmed a lot around here, in this same graveyard here, I'm going to do uh, a couple more films, one I've already done, uh, which you can see on Dietrich Eckhart, who is one of the founders of the Nazi party, and a pretty nasty person, in my opinion, he died in 1923, and uh, we're also now on another film uh, about some of the military uh, memorials in this graveyard.